inspire, connect, resource, growing healthy churches, is in relationship for God's mission. Well, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see you. We've we've really been looking forward to this day and we're really grateful to Rachel who's given up time to be with us. Uh, I, I think this is one of the most important issues that we need to talk about as church in this day. Uh, for many of us, one of the elephants in the room is what we're doing in terms of developing, reaching out, uh, equipping, enabling uh, young generation, young leaders, young disciples to emerge amongst our churches. And I think it's a challenge, not just uh, for smaller churches, it's a challenge for every church across our, our, the United Kingdom at this time. So we're really grateful to have Rachel to be part of uh, this session uh, and to share with us. Uh, I've realised that Rachel and I, um, we've got a few connections. So we both, uh, we both grew up in Sussex. Um, uh, Rachel also went to London School of Theology. I went to London Bible College in the days when it was called London Bible College. Uh, and we both started our ministry uh, in youth work, in youth ministry, schools work and so forth. Uh, Rachel has continued in that vein. She's, she's a youth worker at heart and says she will always be so until the end, end of um, her <laughs> calling under yeah, God. Come on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whereas, whereas my journey has been slightly different from that point point on but Rachel we're really really pleased to have you you're 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 a youth worker at heart you still do youth work you got you became fairly well known through no sex please we're teenagers that the BBC did a documentary on which you were part of Uh, you founded the Romance Academy Um, you're now director of Youthscape president of GB uh, an author and a campaigner in your spare time not that you have much spare time and you're also a mother to two children and a wife. So um, it's it's an exhausting life, but we're so grateful that you've given us some of your precious time to join with us. So Rachel, let me just quickly pray for you and then you lead us. Lord, we thank you for Rachel and we ask for your blessing to be upon her now. And we pray that the spirit of God would speak through us in this key issue about young people particularly. Uh, And may we hear your voice and be equipped by you to act well for the glory of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Thank you. In a minute, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get all technical, but I just want to look you all beautiful people in the eye um, because I'm so sad that I can't be meeting you physically. I was so looking forward to coming, to being released from the north, coming back to the south, which is my comfort zone. And I've been so excited to meet you all. Um, but Zoom is good, isn't it? And um, thank you, Joth, for so kindly saying that I'm giving out some of my precious time. Do you know what? I'm, I'm really conscious that you're giving up your precious time too um, and that you're leading a church in, in a time where, you know, there's no books written on how you lead churches through pandemics. Like, I mean, it's been throughout history, God's people have risen up in extraordinary times, but I'm so mindful of, of what you're facing. Um, and so my heart, although I absolutely want to provoke and challenge and inspire around this topic, I really want to encourage you and, and for my words to bless you immensely, because God is so delighted with you. (laughs) You are his son, you are his daughter, and I really want today to bless your heart and to provoke you to action. Um, But I I know that I've got in front of me people who love young people, who love your communities, so I'm totally seeing us all, you know, we're in this together, and I really hope that my words encourage you. I'm using a keynote presentation, which I tend to wrap, I tend to go through things quite quickly. I don't have lots of text on the screens, so it might feel like you get to the end of the session and think, oh my goodness, I feel like I've been on the fastest train ever, and I've not grabbed any of it. So what my commitment is, once today is over, and everyone's cooled down, and we've kind of let things Settle. If you'd like the content from my slides, I can't let you have the images, but I can let I can kind of pull out the content and create a PDF. And if you think that you would like that, um, because there's some things that you missed, then I'd be very happy to get that to you. So maybe Joff, I can arrange that with you. Brilliant. So now the technical stuff happens. I'm going to share the screen, and then I'm going to 
keep going for it and uh, you can see the slides that I'm using here we go brilliant that should be working fantastic so so when the doors of the church reopen a big question that I find myself asking and lots of youth workers I chat to and, and us at Youthscape very much are asking is when the doors of the church reopen will young people be there and one of the things that we've noticed through, particularly through these three months, and, and the organisation that I work for, we've been taking weekly polls and surveys of young people and youth workers to find out how youth ministry is faring in this time. What we found across the board is that youth workers are telling us they have lost contact with the fringe. So young people that we only meet through schools, through detached youth work, um, through pupil referral centres, um, those that are experiencing tech poverty, so they can't actually access us online, we've lost them. Um, we're also discovering, of course, the National Youth Agency is predicting that three million young people are going to emerge from lockdown with increased mental health, emotional health needs. So we're discovering that discipleship has been very hard in this time and evangelism and detached work has been non-existent. And it's also revealed to us how so much of the churches across denominations, so much of the church's youth ministry is built on a facilitated evangelism model. The idea being, we will put on events for you young people to invite your friends to and our commitment is we'll try not to be too weird. And we're realizing that for 20 years we've been saying we've got to raise young disciples to be the evangelists of their generation. And we hit lockdown and realized that we really have to be doing this. This innovation, we've had to be doing it all along. And of course, this summer, there would, would have been many Christian youth events and festivals and camps, so Survive and New Wine, all the different regional ones that groups would have run that are not running this summer. And this summer was a real key time for about 100,000 young people to go deeper in their faith and for a huge number to become Christians for the first time. So youth ministry, is in a very significant time right now. What we used to do, we can't do. And what we used to rely on to see young people come to Jesus is not there. So this is a really exciting time for church leaders like yourself to be part of the conversation because this isn't, this isn't just an issue for youth workers. This is for the whole church, isn't it? Which is why you're here. It's exciting, but it's also daunting and one of the things that's quite daunting about this time is that never before have we seen such key um, differences between generations in one church in one leadership and, and actually as we emerge from covid what we're noticing is that different generations are dealing with this in different ways and the generation the church has struggled to reach in this time is younger people. So here we go, here's some thoughts for you. So we're gonna to start today, this first session before you're allowed coffee, we're gonna do the work of, of doing a little bit of a diagnosis. Now, in a morning on Zoom, I can't say everything that needs to be said. And actually, I'm not an expert, I'm an adventurer. I've been 20 years adventuring in youth ministry. So some of this is built on evidence and the research from our center. Some of it is drawn from other sources and journals and documents. Some of it is just my kind of observation and learned experience and you might resonate with it. You might well have questions and think I've missed stuff out. So I'm excited to say we're gonna have big times for group work to get some of those things out. So we're gonna look at a diagnosis. Then after the break, um, we're gonna look at the sweet spot. So what can the church do? What are the unique opportunities at this time to reach emerging generations? So first up, the bad news really, the kind of diagnosis. Second bit, the sweet spot. So uh, the diagnosis then, what I'd like to do in this session is look at two key areas and the impact they have on reaching young people. So first we're gonna look a little bit about multi-generations. It's the rich diversity of our churches that we are multi-generational, but unless we pay attention to it, we can be losing the emerging generations because we're not moving swift enough to respond to them. And the second thing, we're just gonna look a little bit at the impact of young people growing up in, in Cannabula, in the cradle period after digital revolution. And we're talking about the birth of the internet then. So first up, multi-generations. So a generation definition is a group of people born around the same time, they're predicting 
over a 30 year period, but that is actually shrinking. Sociologists are saying that generations emerging from this time are going to be changing every five years. So at the beginning is 30 years, going down to five years. So over 30 year periods and raised around the same place, people in this birth cohort exhibit similar characteristics, preferences and values over their lifetime. And it's worth saying, I think, that for all that we as the church, and when I say the church, I mean across denominations. I'm Church of England. And I know I'm speaking into the Baptist um, church denomination, but when I say the church, I mean sort of across all of us. The way that we talk about, we, we, we want to innovate, but actually the reality is that the vast majority of churches in the UK, we tend to skew older we tend to default to the older models. So we have leadership that tends to be older, over the age of 40, I'm over the age of 40, um, and we tend to skew past. So we tend to say, um, what happened in the past, what worked then, we'll do that again. And so what tends to happen is, church leadership tends to be in the hands of people who share a generation, or they exhibit similar characteristics, preferences, and values. They tend to be from the same generation. Generation. And that has an impact on how churches are led. And I thought just a little fun way to kind of unpack the different generations is to think about how the British Army <laughs> has gone about recruiting uh, soldiers from these different generations. So stay, stay with me. And if you see your generation names, you might want to give a bit of a whoop whoop, that's my generation. So first up, the silent generation. These are people born 1945 and before. Um, and they are traditionalists. They value workplaces that are conservative, that are hierarchical and have a ch clear chain of command, that top-down management. And so basically the British Army just said to them, we want you, you just have got to, you've got to sign up. So they appeal to their sense of duty. Then we have the baby boomer generation, those born 1946 to 1964. Um, and baby boomers value workplaces that have flat hierarchies, democratic cultures, good human values, equal opportunities, warm and friendly environments. And some of us on this Zoom will be in this cohort. Some of us were called into ministry by leaders in this cohort because leaders in this cohort often are incredibly good at being pastoral, caring, looking out for people. So the British Army said, the boomer generation, we want you and your devotion to the common good. That really appealed to the boomer generation. Stick with me, we're rapidly moving quite fast. Then we have Gen X. There are some Gen Xers out there, I know. Uh, Gen X was born 1965 to 1976. Generation Xers value workplaces that are fun, positive, efficient, fast paced, highly creative, flexible, and continually providing feedback. That kind of external loop. How was that? How could we have done that differently? That doesn't feel like a threat. Um, and so the British Army, to get hold of Gen Xers, said, We want you and your self belief. We want you and your self-belief. And then we come down to Gen Z. I don't know if you've seen this, it's really funny campaign that the French Army have done. So Gen Z, um, those born 1996 onwards, also called Generation Alpha. Uh, Gen Z, unsurprisingly, because of the times that we're in, are motivated by security. Uh, they may be more competitive, they want to be super independent, they can multitask, they're entrepreneurial, they are digital natives, but they value face-to-face -face communication and they want to be catered to. And so the British Army very cleverly, I mean, look at this campaign, me, 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 millennials, selfie addicts, it's really gone for the kind of the zeitgeist thought process of millennials. You do you. We want you to do you. You haven't got to change the world because this is a generation that saw the last generation not change the world and, and slightly kill themselves trying to do it. They don't have to change the world. Just you do you, you be you. Okay, so that's very rapid <laughs> looking at the different generations, but sociologists talk about how the key differences boil down between the generations, boil down to these three areas, communication skills, the ability to adapt to change, 
and technical abilities. I mean, I, I am sort of bridging Gen, um, Gen Y and Gen Z, and I'm terrible at technology. So all of us in our own way will totally buck the trends. And there'll be some of you, you know, in your 60s who are absolute whizzes on things changing rapidly. So this is not to kind of label generations and be prescriptive about them, but to recognize the challenges around this. So regarding communication skills then, baby boomers, tend to be more reserved, they're cautious leaders. Gen Z favor command and control, we're gonna do this. Uh, Gen Y prefer collab collaboration, let's do this together. Let's get all the churches together, let's, let's, let's hang out together, let's do a youth service for the whole place. And Gen Z, they want personal communication. So think about change management then, baby boomers are cautious, Gen X and Gen Y see change as a new opportunity, but Gen Z, you haven't even got to mention that the change is about to happen. They completely expect change to happen. They're not floored by it. They're not thrown by it. Of course, individuals in these communities will be, but as a cohort, they expect things to change. And then regarding technical ability, baby boomers and Gen Z value instructor-led courses and self-learning tools. But millennials prefer collaboration and, and technology-centered options. Um, and they, and they, 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 I, somebody I heard on the um, conversation coming in said, let's do what the young people in our youth group do. They immediately change their names on their Zoom profiles. I have never had that independent thought to change a name on my Zoom thing to something funny. But the young people, last night I was doing a youth thing with some younger youth, and while I was doing the Zoom thing, they were all using the art function and creating things. I'd never said to them, do that. But they got on, they got a hold of technology, and whereas I'm seeing it as a way to communicate and connect, they were collaborating. They were creating. Their way of connecting with, with culture and digital stuff was just so different to my generation, and we're seeing these changes so massively now. So there's a brilliant quote from a guy um, called James Emery White. And if there's one book that I, that you guys get, that I want to recommend to you to get hold of, it's, it's called Meet Generation Z by a church pastor of a mega church in America called James Emery White. And he talks about how Generation Z, so we're going to start zoning in on this group now, Gen Z, sort of age 25 and below, will be the most influential religious force in the West and the heart of the missional challenge facing the Christian church. Gen Z will also soon be the largest generation in the workplace. So very rapidly, the way Gen Z functions as a generation it's going to be the way the kind of everything is is geared towards them they're quick paced they're fast moving their a sense of creating their sense of self is going to become the main focus for the way that community moving forward functions so that was thinking a little bit about um generations but also we're also recognizing that this is a generation who are massively impacted by some huge beasts that they are growing up through. So number one, Brexit. When uh, the country voted to leave the UK, um, I was working in North London and uh, the reaction of young people, rightly or wrongly, and I'm not gonna get into political discussion now, but the reaction of the young people in North London who I spoke to was they absolutely felt the old generations were sailing them down the river. And that wasn't what was in the minds of older people as they voted on however people voted. But their feeling was anyone over the age of 18 who voted <laughs> was choosing to put their safety before that of younger people. Then COVID-19, so much talk about keeping people safe and yet we very rarely hear um, from the government, from community leaders, how young people are doing and how young people are going to fare um, through this. And of course, Black Lives Matter um, is a brilliant example of how generations cope differently with responding to massive issues of social injustice. If you think about um, the baby boomers civil rights movement, you can name the leader, can't you? Martin Luther King Jr. When you think about the millennials, the Gen Z's, um, uh, the Gen Y, sorry, uh, uh, response 
to civil injustice, to the murder of George Floyd, what we get is no named leader. There's no obvious leader of the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a hashtag. And the hashtag is so powerful that even though only about 100 people on this hashtag say they want the statue of Winston Churchill pulled down, the Prime Minister, in question time, talks about how he doesn't want Winston Churchill's statue pulled down. There's the, the, the power of a movement of Gen Y saying this matters is so, so significant. So young people are growing up in a world where this is their reality. And Jonathan Grant, in his book, Divine Sex, which is another excellent book, not particularly about um, uh, gener generations, um, sort of reaching young people so much as how um, culture is shaping young people's idea about their self and about their sexual self particularly. But he says this, Christian leaders tend to use scripture as their exclusive resource for framing Christian speaking and living. And yet he says only through a thick kind of thick description of our present circumstances being attentive to both the world and the church, can we deeply understand the hope of the gospel in redefining and reforming the self within our complex times? And this is really what I want to spend most of the time talking about. But before I do that, just look at the backdrop of that slide, Brexit, COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. In the background is a photo of a hurricane. It's a photo of Hurricane Mitch that landed um, on Honduras in the 1990s. It was one of the most powerful hurricanes in the, in the 20th century. And overnight, um, they predict that it kind of destroyed 80% of Honduras's communications and road net networks. So overnight, roads were destroyed, um, railway lines were destroyed, communication methods were completely destroyed. And they quickly realised, the government quickly realised that to come out of this massive hurricane, they couldn't just simply lay down roads where roads used to be. They couldn't just go back to how it was. They had to reimagine a whole new way to get Honduras back up on its feet. I'm going to show you later a really powerful image on that and what they did. But I think I use that image because I think... The, what we're going through currently with COVID-19 and what we've experienced with the digital revolution and with Brexit and with all that's happened is what we're seeing is like a culture bomb has gone off. And George Floyd's murder was another culture bomb that went off. Um, and we will process it in our own way. But for younger people growing up in this world, this stuff has the power to completely reshape everything that they know and so as people who care desperately about reaching this generation for Jesus we need to be leaders who are prepared to look at a shattered landscape and say rather than default to what used to work are we prepared to look for the new places to lay down the pipelines to reach these young people. New ways, I mean, Louise and our little group were saying, actually coming out of COVID-19, I think mental health is gonna be one of the big things that we as a church got to respond to. That's the kind of thinking that I'm talking about. You know, Jesus is unchanged. The gospel has happened, the good news has happened. We get to be speaking and preaching the good news. But Leslie Newbegin says that the gospel is forwarded every generation to a new address. So the question for us is, What's the new address in the fallout of all this stuff that we need to understand so we can forward the gospel to the new address? So that's where I'm coming from on this. So what I'd like to do now is before we break into our groups is uh, to unpack five key things in culture that are shaping young people's identity and sense of self. And it's so important that we understand this. I call it the misformation of the self. So understanding the nature of the modern self, how young people see themselves, how they understand their identity, how they deal with the world and their relationships has enormous significance for spiritual leaders because it cuts to the heart of Christian identity and mission within our culture. Is Christian identity being formed by the church 
or is it being formed by culture at large? And I imagine you have a gut response to that. So the overwhelming psychological question that every teenager is asking, whether they live in Honduras or Hartlepool, whether they're from a Christian family or not, the psychological question they are asking the world is, who am I? Um, I've got this picture of a chair here. And you can imagine somebody's identity being built like we build a chair. So you've got there the four legs of the chair and a child psychologist will talk about the four psychological questions that babies up to prepubescent children need, need answered. So it's questions like, can I trust? Have I got what it takes? Am I any good at this stuff? So the unaware they're asking it, but these are the developmental questions that children need to have answered before they can move to the next stage. And of course, it can be answered positively. Yes, you can trust. There are primary carers in your life who, who care for you, who put your needs first, or they can be answered negatively. No, you can't trust. Your, your family are high on drugs the whole time, so you've had to be taken into care. And actually the world around you is not safe and predictable. You can't trust. And so you have these four like building blocks of identity. And then the question that adolescents are asking is, who am I? Which is a massively daunting question at the best of times, isn't it? But it's particularly daunting if there've been situations in your life where you think I can't trust people or myself. I don't think I've got what it takes. I don't fit in and suddenly, who am I? I'm building my identity on this really rocky foundation. And what also happens if the culture around you says, actually who you need to be is X, Y, and Z. You're a Christian, oh my goodness, that, that means that you're a homophobe and that you hate people and that you're really repressed. Do you see what I mean? So suddenly the who am I question becomes really weaponized in a culture that has very strong identity politics happening. So let me talk you through some of these five key things and this is what we're gonna be talking about. So what are some of the key things that are shaping Gen Z's identity? Number one, digital reality. As the first Wi-Fi enabled generation, these young people are the most self-directed generation. They have in their hand, in their smartphone, contact to, you know, um, connection with most of the world's living people and most of the world's information. They also have you know, access to the most bizarre, perverse, destructive, dangerous stuff they could have, and, and some of the best stuff as well. Like they, they, they are the most self-directed. And actually, gone are the days where adults are the source of information. We need to see ourselves as the advocates of wisdom. It's a very different role. They don't need young adults to tell them the meaning of life. They Google it. <laughs> Number two performance of the individual so for young people growing up today they know that they need to perform who they are along very tightly prescribed lines so let's take the black lives matter as an example um, a number of black young people who i know here in preston and in london were asking huge questions about i re this really matters to me i'm passionate about this but I'm, I don't know that I'm doing, I'm, I don't know I'm saying enough on social media. I don't, do I get a blackout screen on my Insta? Like if I don't perform this, then am I a hater by being silent and not being, not performing along certain lines about gender or about sexuality? Um, if, I'm, if I'm not allying myself to everybody who feels that they have some reason to say I'm being victimized in society, are they then, are they then part of the, the hate? Does that make sense? So for young people today, that desire to be an individual has never been greater, but the fear and the repercussions of getting it wrong have never been more dangerous. For example, if a Christian teenager was to tweet or put on TikTok, penis is male, they probably would have their account taken down they'd be called a hate preacher simply for stating something they perceive as self-evident biology. And so young people are finding they need to be this independent, fully formed, clear sense of this is who I am. I'm loud, I'm proud, I'm this. 
but they also know that if they get it even slightly wrong, they'll be at best cancelled and, and at worst completely destroyed. Um, pornography, pornification of life. I talked about that a little bit, but uh, young people are living today in such close proximity to a world, a universe of pornographies. And we know that the consumption of this sexual content has the power to rewire the brain and completely recalibrate their ideas about self-worth, connection and intimacy. So gone are the days where a youth worker thinks, oh, now I need to do a session on sex with my youth group and I need to be the one to introduce them to it. No, no. What youth workers are having to think now is the young people in my youth group have already seen stuff. They might not have gone looking for it, but they've seen it. So my job now is to somehow be able, have to talk about stuff that, that we shouldn't be having to talk about to 11 year olds, but this is the reality of the world that they're living in. So what's our role when they might have seen the most gratuitous um, sexual um, display of this completely racist, completely sexist, um, and, and, and what's our role in that? So digital reality, performance of the individual, pornification of life. Uh, I told you it'd be heavy <laughs> before coffee, I warned you. Number four, the rise of the nuns. This is not the rise of the nuns, as N-U-N-S, although I'd love to see more of a rise of the nuns, they're amazing women. But this is about, um, in the under 18s, increasingly, religion is not just seen as irrelevant, it's seen as dangerous. And this is what Muslim young people and Christian young people have in common. When Christian young people are radical and passionate about their faith, when they're basically being Christian disciples, they are perceived as fundamental, as fundamentalists. When they say, actually, I think Jesus says this about this lifestyle issue, or I think that following Jesus means this, they're seen as fundamental. Um, and so what we see is, among under 25 year olds, we are not gonna see nominalism. It doesn't benefit young people at all to be nominally Christian. There's no benefit socially to saying they're a Christian. So if a young person owns that they belong to Jesus, you have in front of you somebody who is prepared to be seen as radical and fundamental. And I think this is a bit of shift in our thinking that we've got to really get hold of. So we know at Preston Minster that if somebody under the age of 30 comes along to a service, the only reason they're there is because they want to be there. There's no social benefit to them coming to our services. So they're there because they're asking big questions. So suddenly we have to match that with community and with challenge and real discipleship because they're not on a fence they're, they're, they're in, they're like exploring this. And that's been interesting about the digital space, hasn't it? About people trying out church from afar. So one last point, and then we're gonna go into our groups because I realized that we, uh, yeah, good, we're right on time. So the last one, number five, is the new total tolerance. And, and I think we, we see this a lot in social media. Um, we see it at the moment happening with um, J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, with her views around uh, biology and the trans debate. Um, and there's a new total tolerance that, that goes like this. Um, your words and ideas, if they disagree with what I think or feel, so significantly affects my ability to function that even your presence damages me. And I need you to come and ally with me and speak against them because that's the kind of protection I need in order to function. And we did some research at Youthscape um, into trying to find out how young people are asking questions of faith when they live in a world that says, if you ask a question, you, you sound like you're disagreeing with somebody and you're questioning them. So we, we did a bit of research and we had, um, I think about 20 Christian youth workers conducting hour long conversations with unchurched young people. And we just kept saying to them, do you have any questions about life, about faith, about where you go when you die? And for the majority of the conversation, these young people said, no, 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 I'm fine, no, I'm fine whatever you know and, and it was interesting because you, you think so much youth evangelism is built on the on the model of apologetics young people are asking questions so let's answer them but we found devastating in this research young people were not asking questions so we called the research no questions asked 
But interestingly, at the end of every interview, when the interview was switched off and the youth worker said to the young person, how did you find that? They said this, invariably they said this, that was amazing. Like no one's ever asked me that stuff. Like I don't have anybody to ask stuff to. So the, the, the youth worker was saying, but you didn't ask anything. <laughs> but the young person was saying, but nobody ever asks me if I have questions. So it kind of, it, it's propelled a massive bit of research for us at Youth Tape about, well, how do we, in this environment, how do we help call that curiosity out of young people. And this is what I'm talking about, about this thick description. Like you and I could think about young people in our community and think they're not asking any questions about faith. Well, on the surface, they're not because it's too dangerous. But what if we understood that and we realized that and we responded differently and we, we did stuff, not that worked with teenagers 30 years ago, but that works with teenagers now because all of this stuff that i've chucked at you which you're probably like ah, what was that all of this combines in such a way that means that at the moment there is a huge wedge between church and youth culture but that wedge is a lie because jesus is good news for every generation and we need to be leaders that like leslie newbegin says the gospel is simply being forwarded to a new address. And on our watch, that's when the new address is, is opening up. And we could be leaders that keep going this way and skewing older and doing all we could say, let's enter the ugly zone. And, and sports people know about the ugly zone, the bit that feels uncomfortable because actually our mission is to connect. So I will now stop and you will be flung beautifully into groups. And these will be your questions. Ah, let me just back that up with this image. So this is a photo from Honduras taken a couple of years after the uh, hurricane. Can you see there's a, you might've seen this picture before, it's well known. There, the bridge is not over the river. At one time that bridge was over the river, but the hurricane came and the river changed course and that bridge is no longer relevant. And that's, I suppose that's the tantalizing image to have in our minds. Jesus is always relevant. The gospel is always relevant. And as those that carry the gospel within us, our, the question for us is how do we make sure we're, put, we're building bridges in the right places, not in the places that used to work, work but don't work anymore. So here we go, here are your questions. Does any of this marry up to your experience? or the perspectives of young people you know and you might say no talk about that might say yes number two how have the needs of young people been understood and addressed during this time i called it covod i know it's covid COVID. <laughs> both politically and on a local church level what's your response to this and number three when it comes to reaching and discipling young people what ways has the church nationally become a bridge no longer over river but if you're feeling brave Maybe the church that you've been called to serve. How has the church that you're in become a bridge that's no longer over a river? So I don't know how brave you're feeling for that. So, great. Well, I'm just going to wrap up very briefly. Do you, do you feel overwhelmed? I mean, I, de I deliberately brought out some big things there, big things. Do you feel overwhelmed? Well, if you feel overwhelmed, slightly annoyed at me, you've got too much in your plate anyway, you know, good, actually. You're feeling the exile. And I, I think at the time of the exile, when God's people were sent into the desert and they wandered around for 40 years to learn how to trust God, um, God took away their Jerusalem. And in taking away their Jerusalem, he gave them the whole world, didn't he? Because God is after a people from every tribe, every tongue, every generation. And I think a little bit of my heart for this first part of the morning was, if we feel like the stuff that maybe was working pre-lockdown just isn't going to. And if, if we have churches that are saying, great, let's get back to everything that was, and you're thinking, no, this is a time to try new things. I want to kind of feel that and say, good, you're feeling the exile. And as God takes away maybe some of the things that we used to rely on, he's going to give us the whole world, which is always his dream for his church. So in this next section, um, after coffee, it's, good. it's called the sweet spot. We're thinking about what is it that as churches we are best placed to do in reaching this generation. I've got lots of good news and hope stories for you because I, I think actually reaching this generation 
is going to be one of the most exciting things that we as a church do because lots of the baggage of previous generations lots of the stuff of having to unchurch people and convert them to christianity we're not going to need to do it's going to be a very different mission field so come back after coffee stick around um, and we're going to be looking at some beautiful things that we can do to engage this generation in following jesus Inspire, connect, resource, growing healthy churches. It's in relationship for God's mission.